everyone, it's Hayes and in today's video we're going to be doing the commentary slash analysis on Queen Banana which is episode 8 of Miraculous Ladybug season 4. As always I'm about to spoil the full episode for you so I will leave some links in the description box to where you can watch it and over the next few weeks I'll monitor them and try to replace them with links when they get taken down for copyright and stuff but if you're watching this several months from when this video comes out there will probably be no links available there for you to watch. You'll have to wait until it comes on like Netflix or Disney Plus or something. So, Queen Banana, did I dress up for this video? Maybe. <laughs> I've been waiting a while to wear this. I was like, oh, I could wear that for a video today. I was like, no, wait, that top would be perfect for the Queen Banana commentary. So I, I waited for Queen Banana to wear this. So you're all very welcome. So let's get started with the commentary. So if you want my quick thoughts on the episode, and I was trying during this episode to not let the fact that I pretty much knew what was going to happen or just knew all the spoilers anyway, I was trying to not let that stop my enjoyment of the episode. I was still trying to enjoy it. So I am going to do this commentary as if we didn't get any spoils. I'm going to try my best to be unbiased because no, I didn't enjoy it as much because of how much it got spoiled. I'm pretty sure you're probably in the same boat. You may have liked the episode, but in comparison to some other episodes, you probably didn't enjoy it as much because of how much we knew about it, right? So I'm going to try and be unbiased about that. However, it definitely wasn't my favourite episode. I would give it a 6 out of 10, which I think is the lowest one I've given for an episode this season. And I think the reason for it is, and I'll go into it more later, was because I didn't care about Chloe. I just, I was just like, oh, okay, like she was horrible in Soul Crusher, absolutely horrible. And she was horrible in this one. I had like kind of thought that maybe the class purposely left her out of the film and like replaced her with a half sister. So she got upset and I was like, okay, that's a fair enough reason to be upset about. I would be too. I completely get it. You would be justified. But I mean, I mean, they did technically leave her out because she was being unreasonable with all these stupid demands all because she hated her sister or hates her sister still so i struggled to care about her character and her acclimatization and the reason for it because of the way she's been acting recently so onto the film i'm glad they had adult supervision this time from several different adults because god knows this class needs some adult supervision from time to time <laughs> and also if you didn't know so the art room at dupont is called room 33 which is like this room at thomas asterix high school where you could go and just do whatever you want in terms of art it's really special to him it's kind of like how he became an artist and a writer himself and he got to be in there in the show so i would assume it was done on purpose and it probably meant a lot to him to be able to be in the episode in that room that meant a lot to him. And during the art room scene as well we get some more insight into Chloe's motivations for her being the way she is in this episode and I was just like <sighs> again she was just horrible for no reason in Soul Crusher she was horrible for no reason I just didn't get it like I it definitely was an overreaction and I get the exaggerate stuff for the show so it definitely wasn't an accurate reaction I get it was exaggerated for the show but I just don't understand why she's so horrible now like I genuinely did feel like someone made an interesting comment on my soul crusher commentary because I was like I felt like Zoe and Chloe would make up by the end of the episode someone made a comment about how they felt soul crusher and queen banana were like a part one part two and I was like oh I think you're gonna be totally right and now they said it I was like yeah I can see that happening so I had kind of assumed that by the end of queen banana there would be something between Zoe and Chloe but it just didn't happen I was I just didn't get it I thought this episode I didn't expect it to become a good person in this episode but I did think this episode would teach her something even just a little something just teach her something nothing to make her drastically change overnight nothing like that just tiny something so that's definitely one reason why I didn't like the episode but also, but also just with the show in general, especially in season one where a lot of the episodes were filler episodes, with a lot of those characters we had no like history with them. So for example, when Ali gets akumatized into Lady Wi-Fi for the first time, we've seen her for a few episodes. We already like Alia as a character, assuming you like Alia. So when she gets akumatized, we feel something for her and we want the situation to be resolved and for her to make up with everyone in the end because we have some background with Alia. However, there have been some episodes where we don't have like any history with the person who gets akumatized. For example, Stormy Weather. However, Stormy Weather 
it makes you feel something because of what happened to um, a raw, is that how you say her name? I don't know. But it makes you feel something because of the way she kind of gets treated when she loses the competition. So even though we haven't really seen a raw prior to the episode or really know anything about her prior to the episode, you still feel bad for her and it's an enjoyable episode because you care about her. I did not care about Chloe and this is why I struggled to, you know, have a connection with her. The thing I like about Miraculous is the way it makes me feel, like the way Optigami has me feeling at the minute is just... <laughs> insane right now. So right now I'm really struggling to like this episode because I don't care about Chloe. Like I thought the episode was good for Vesperia, I absolutely love Vesperia, but it didn't make me like Chloe. These past two episodes have been really bad for Chloe. They're definitely writing her to make us dislike her, which is fine if that's what you want to do, that's fine. That's obviously where you want to take the character of Chloe, okay. But I was just like, yeah, there was just no emotional connection between us <laughs> and I just, yeah, that's kind of the reason why I didn't enjoy it because I didn't care about it. Have I explained that enough? Do, do you get what I mean? Like I just, I didn't care because she was being downright horrible to everybody. So now let's move on to the actual filming itself and I just have to ask, is this film foreshadowing something? So Zoe was portraying the superheroine of creation and Malen of destruction, which is obviously mirroring Ladybug and Chat Noir. But in this situation, they were fighting each other. Something had happened, they'd fallen out, they were fighting each other, and Milan, by the sounds of it, had put all these people to sleep. Is this foreshadowing what's going to happen in the show? Is something bad going to happen between Ladybug and Chat Noir? Where maybe, I've always thought this maybe could happen, and I usually like to read fan fictions about this, about Chat Noir working with his dad. But is that foreshadowing this? Maybe I'm just looking too much into it, and I probably am. I look too much into this show. I I know I do. <laughs> I know that. But is that maybe a foreshadowing that? Maybe? I kind of would love to see that in the show. I think it'd be really interesting to see. Now we move on to Adrian in a cage. I understand in the episode he says his dad really likes the film, it's for the purpose of the film, I don't mind doing it, it's okay. I get that's what he says. But Gabriel is so protective over him, wouldn't let him go to school, which is you know, marginally safer in France than being suspended in a cage from a helicopter above Paris. Where is Daddy Agrest's logic in this? I just... I liked it, but I was just like, um... Okay! <laughs> it was very weird. However, since he was in the cage, he missed Marinette being more ladybug-like. And this episode, when she was in Marinette form, she was really assertive, a lot like Ladybug. I really enjoyed it, but um... Adrian missed it all, so well done, <laughs> great. When we get to see the film, I absolutely loved the eye makeup that Milan and Zoe had on. That was something really different for the series. They'd never really done that before. I really liked that. And I was actually really happy when Daddy Agress was like, I really enjoyed this film for my son. I was like, yes, yes, he's there for Adrian. But then the tablet turns off and we find out, actually, no, he was doing this to get Chloe acclimatized. <sighs> you know, Daddy Agress, Father's Day is coming up. And I don't think Adrian's going to be getting you a present if he found out about all of this. You are not a nice dad. So now let's just talk briefly about Adrian and Chloe's relationship. Chloe quite clearly doesn't listen to her dad. She doesn't like Zoe, so why would she listen to Zoe? And she doesn't like anyone else in the class, so why would she listen to them? The one person Chloe has consistently listened to in the show is Adrian. The whole plot of Despair Bear is Adrian trying to get Chloe to be a better person and he is really the only person she is receptive to in any way, shape or form. So I was really surprised to see her knock him back. I know we don't get a great deal of Adrian and Chloe interaction in the show so I don't know if they're gonna really develop this further but I did think it was really interesting and it just shows how far Chloe has come. To my knowledge I'm pretty sure Adrian and Chloe's relationship was fine by the end of season three it was fine but now it's like this literally the only person chloe has in her corner is sabrina and sabrina's only there because she's scared of chloe and it seems like her mum is somewhat scared of chloe though i'm not sure why because audrey's the same and so is her dad so it's just there's literally no one there for chloe and yeah i do feel bad about it 
but it's like her, all her own doing. So for example, the next scene when she's crying in the car, when we saw that clip the first time, I was like, oh, I do feel bad for you. But then we saw Soul Crusher and I was just like, mm, not sure if I feel that bad for you anymore. But now we've seen all of Queen Banana. I don't feel bad for her in the slightest because yeah, they did replace her with her sister. So yeah, they did replace her with her sister. But first of all, Zoe seems to have won the part. She attended the audition or whatever and she got it over Chloe because Chloe told everyone they were stupid and looked horrible essentially. And then even when Chloe did join the production, she was being silly and unreasonable with all of her demands. So when we see her crying, I didn't feel bad for her in the slightest. So yeah, they have technically replaced her with her half-sister in this film, but the role wasn't Chloe's in the first place. And second of all, when she did get the role, she was horrible about it, so I didn't feel bad for Chloe in the slightest. Was it nice to see her cry? No, not really. But do I feel bad about it? No, not really. I've said it before in this video already, just trying to hammer on the point. I didn't enjoy this episode because I didn't care about Chloe. I, I didn't care. <laughs> so the Akuma battle begins and Agent and Marinette run off to transform. And if you needed any more confirmation that this season is essentially more focused on Marinette than Adrian, I mean, she is the main character anyway, but we got Marinette's transformation sequence. We didn't get one for Adrian. He just transformed and we saw the lights. There was no transformation sequence. So could we argue it was done to save time because Vesperia was getting a transformation sequence and they usually take about the same amount of time? Yeah, we could argue that, but it just goes to show like <laughs> how much more important Marinette this season is than Adrian. And whilst I would personally love to see more of Adrian, because apart from Lies, we haven't really gotten a great deal of Adrian screen time. Lies and Guilt Trip were the best episodes for Adrian so far. I'm hoping Optigami are going to get a lot more of Adrian. I'm hoping for a lot from Optigami, to be honest. None of which I am emotionally prepared for, to be honest. <laughs> However, I'm finding I don't really mind it because to me it's showing the balance in characters because season one Marinette was definitely used for comic relief and it's becoming less like that in season four where Chat Noir, the complete opposite, is being used as the comic relief character. So I'm kind of liking the parallels between them in this season so far. <laughs> However, when Chat says we make a perfect duo, milady. Like it was a lovely line, there's nothing wrong with the line, but I feel like that's clear to me that Ladybug still hasn't told Chat Noir that she told someone her identity. Just because I don't think he'd say that if he knew she had told someone else, I just, I don't think he would. I think he'd um, be pretty sad about it and would avoid saying things like that. However, does Chat Noir know Vesperia's identity? Because Ladybug and Chat Noir both put in those earpieces and it didn't show them taking them out, so surely he would have heard Ladybug say, Zoe Lee, this is the Bee Miraculous. So does Chat Noir know who Vesperia is? He seemed pretty surprised when she showed up, so maybe not, maybe he had taken them out, but I was like, um, you still got those earpieces and do you know who she is? I know he's not supposed to know, I know he knows the Pig Miraculous one now, but that was kind of unavoidable because of the situation they were in, but I was just like, does he know that it's Zoe? I absolutely love the lucky charm in this episode, especially when it, first of all, when it fell and she was ready to catch it and then she like screamed and jumped out of the way. I was 100% ready for her to catch that lucky charm. <laughs> Although I was extremely disappointed that Ladybug and Chat Noir didn't grab the Vespa together and throw up in the air to the miraculous Ladybug at the end. I was heartbroken by it. <laughs> However, speaking of the Vespa, I absolutely loved the Akira reminiscence scene. So if you don't know what Akira is, it's a Japanese animated film in like the normal Japanese anime style. It's one of my all-time favourite films. I absolutely love the reference. When we first saw the teaser for it, it, it went straight over my head. It's a really good film. Uh, it can be a bit gross at times, so don't watch it if you're underage, if you haven't seen it. But if you're overage and you haven't seen it, Great film, I recommend it. If you're underage, my other favourite films are The Princess Diaries and The Princess Diaries 2. They're great films. <laughs> Zoe was absolutely amazing as Vesperia. We all know how much I like Zoe. I think she was wonderful. And I do think she was better than Chloe as Queen Bee in terms of using the miraculous, not comparing their personality. Like, I mean, I do think Zoe is a better person than Chloe. There's no avoiding that. I do think she is a better person. However, I feel like she was just, like, this was just her. She is, like, the new proper holder of the Bee Miraculous, as she said in the episode. And speaking of Vesperia, Chat Noir didn't really flirt with her. However, does Plague have a crush on her? He sounded like he was like, oh, she's so sweet and kind, much nicer than Ladybug. And Plague knows who Ladybug is in real life. So I was just like, Plague, do you have a crush on Zoe? So now let's talk about the charms. And I had thought after we saw uh, Mr. Pigeon 72 and what we saw in Soul Crusher with the charm, 
I had thought the charm would just protect you from negative emotions and it wouldn't necessarily stop an Akuma attack because if the charms did stop Akumas from affecting you, from turning you or whatever, like how would that pan out for just A, the future of the show with Gabriel as Shadow Daddy, how would that work? But also the new Hawk Moth, like who are they going to be able to akumatize? I don't get it. So I'm assuming when this new Hawk Moth comes in, something's going to happen to all of these charms because I would assume it would work against all Akumas no matter who is using the Butterfly Miraculous. I don't think this is going to happen, but if Natalie was maybe like, what episode, you know what, I'm going to use the Butterfly Miraculous and she sent out an Akuma, I'm pretty sure she still wouldn't be able to get to people if they had the charm. So, yeah, I am a bit confused now. Like, I understand how the charm works now, 100% get it. But I did think it was going to only protect against negative emotions to help you not get akumatized, that it wasn't going to be a foolproof way to stop you from getting akumatized, because how could Ladybug create something that actively stops other miraculouses affecting you because the miraculouses aren't supposed to be used for evil. However, at the same time, she is a holder of the miraculous of creation she can create whatever she feasibly wants so she technically could do that and it was quite obvious the charm doesn't necessarily protect against negative emotions because as soon as Chloe put the charm on she was quite clearly still feeling negatively about things so it quite obviously protects against the Akuma themselves so I was just like yeah I found it really interesting especially in terms of the implications for the future of the show and also it was quite clear Shadow Daddy had absolutely zero idea about these charms before. So the first time we see the charm is in episode 4, Mr Pigeon 72, we see them in 6, Furious Foo, 7, Soul Crusher, 8, Queen Banana and we also saw them in Guilt Trip which was episode 11. So I would assume they're definitely going to be a thing in episode 5 and 10, I'm not sure about 9 just because it seems like it might be a flashback episode about Gabriel so I don't think the charms are going to be involved however if Ladybug does give him a charm I'm sure he'll use it to his advantage to learn more about her and how the charms work so I'm pretty sure from here on out the so I'm pretty sure from here on out there's going to be a charm almost every single episode but it did seem that this episode was the first time he actually saw its effects and that he knew about it so in that same scene we also saw the mayor finally come through and defend Zoe of tiny little bit it was still great to see <laughs> still good to see he definitely is more of a backbone but it's a start it's better than nothing at this moment in time I would say he's a better person than his daughter which also kind of speaks to how bad of a parent he was in the first place I guess so now let's talk about Chloe again and like I said I really did think her and Zoe were gonna make up even just slightly like I don't mean make up as in be best friends start holding hands everywhere as in be like okay you're my sister, I accept you as my sister. Chloe just doesn't seem to accept Zoe as her sister, she's just like you're not related to me, you're nothing like me, we can't be related, I don't want you as my sister. So I was just like right okay, I did genuinely feel they were gonna make up in this episode. Like this person said in my comments, Soul Crusher and Queen Banana were like part one part two. So I was like by the end of Queen Banana, this unofficial part two, they will make up with each other. <laughs> nope. <laughs> didn't happen. However, when I was watching this episode last night, I was like, okay, well, she didn't make up with Zoe. She's got to make up with Adrian. Nope. <laughs> no, either. So it's just like, okay, so is Hawkmoth maybe going to try and use Chloe like the way he uses Lila? That was my first thought, but then obviously she has the charm. So I'm not exactly sure if Hawk Daddy knows exactly about the charm itself. Like, was he aware what actually stopped Chloe from getting akumatized, or was he just confused as to why she couldn't be akumatized. Like, did he actually understand why? Or was he just like, um, what's going on here lots? What did he actually think? So yeah, six out of 10 for this episode. I really did struggle to like it because I just didn't care about Chloe in this episode. And I feel like the best episodes are the one where you have some sort of feelings towards the, um, the person who gets akumatized and I didn't care, Chloe brought this all on herself. A lot of the other times people get akumatized, it's because of a misunderstanding or because someone has done something to them. This was entirely self-inflicted. No, not for the purpose of getting akumatized like Lila does, but it was entirely self-inflicted. And I just didn't care about it. So MVP of the episode is quite obviously going to Vesperia. She was amazing in this episode and just Zoe in general, I think. 
I think is a great character. However, special mention of MVP goes to Adrian because he is blind. Literally, he was stood in the entrance to the movie theatre. Marinette was stood like outside hiding behind that like partition thing with Tiki on her shoulder. Are you blind? Like, daddy aggressed. Please, please take your son for an eye test and literally within one hour he'll be able to tell you who Ladybug is. Like, this boy, this boy, <laughs> blind, literally blind. So line of the episode goes to Queen Banana. Every single time she said banana boom boom, I thought it was absolutely hilarious. But special mention to the German voice actor for Shadow Daddy with the way he said Queen Banana when he accumulated her. I absolutely loved it. I thought it was hilarious. I can't wait to hear the English version of this episode, which I think is out in a few days time <laughs> to hear how they did it. It was, yeah, I thought that part was hilarious. So yeah, overall, I love Ladybug, I love Chat Noir, I love Marinette, I love Adrian, I love Vesperia, I love Zoe. Didn't care about Chloe. Her redemption is just all over the place. I really did think she would learn a little something and at the very least accept Zoe as a sister. I'm not asking for them to get along with each other like best friends. Just some acceptance but but there was none of that. <laughs> so yeah. So I'd absolutely love to know what you thought of the episode. What did you think of Chloe? What did you think about Vesperia? I thought she was awesome. And a final reminder, Optigami will be airing on the 30th of May which is on Sunday at um, 6.50 p.m. German time and I am not ready for it. I'm not ready for it. So I'd love to know what you think and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!